Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Hello. Is everyone excited to be here? My name is Jennifer Johnson. I'm the Associate Director of the Quality Assurance for the AT&T Integrated Cloud. I have been with AT&T for 11 years. I've held numerous positions within IT operations from engineering, um, lab management, to quality assurance. For the past four years, um, I've worked, with, worked in AIC, which is AT&T's globally distributed network cloud that has more than 80 zones deployed. My team consists of architects as well as quality engineers around the globe. I'll be moderating today's session with a panel of women talking about their experience working with OpenStack to deliver AT&T's integrated cloud. This is my third year at the OpenStack Summit, and I have seen tremendous growth within women um, who've been here, so it's been really exciting to see the progression. The women of OpenStack Foundation um, have done a wonderful job with encouraging women to be part of the growing community. Um, but let me say, there's a lot more work to be done. So I want to share with you a quote from our SVP of HR that really resonated with me. Cry like a baby, fight like a girl, and change the world like a woman. The mantra reminded me that it's OK to cry, but let me say, not in front of everyone. <laughs> but um, fight like a girl. Stand up for what you believe in, and change the world like a woman. Be the leader and not be afraid to succeed. Our panelists up here today know all too well what it means to overcome obstacles and surmount challenges that they faced. The work that they have done has been essential to at and cloud transformation. With that said, let me introduce you to the panel, who are key contributors from development, test, and community teams within AIC. Hi, my name is Janet Morris, and I'm um, a Director of Technology at AT&T, responsible for the um, overall quality assurance of um, AT&T Integrated Cloud. Um, I have 120 um, employees and consultants who work together and define the strategy for um, testing the automation framework and tools we use, the test plans, and actually execute the tests. Um, we are certifying all new features that are being delivered, as well as every deployment in the field. Um, Jen, our moderator, works for me, and she is responsible for the system test team. Um, I get the privilege of being the most senior in years um, on this panel. I spent all, all my years um, at AT&T and held a variety of jobs from software development, system engineering, and, of course, quality assurance. Um, I've been working on um, cloud computing for about seven years, starting with VMware and the OpenStack the last four years. And I've seen the tremendous change within AT&T. It used to be open source was a bad word. It was going to, you know, it was going to hurt our security. It was going to infringe upon our proprietary, and you just couldn't use it. And now we're fully embracing it. So it's been an amazing transformation. Um, on the personal side, um, I'm married and I have three children who I've raised during my career. They're off on their own being independent, and I'm now enjoying the empty life, empty nest syndrome, not empty life. <laughs> <laughs> at and make sure of that. <laughs> I'll pass it on to Anjali. Yeah, my name is Anjali Bansal. I'm a quality architect working for at and Integrated Cloud Project. I'm an Accenture employee working for Accenture from past seven years, and an AIC project I'm working from past two years. We work on automating and execution different different type of test cases like API, CLI, and GUI, uh, which we will discuss in detail as the presentation goes on. So I will pass to Kayla. Yeah, hi, I'm Kayla Frommy. I started at AT&T out of college in 2007, so I'm coming up on 10 years. I was a Java developer for about the first seven uh, when I joined AIC. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, when we were had two production sites, and I've been uh, you know, there from the beginning, growing from two production sites to 80 around the world. Um, I manage, directly manage the OpenStack development scrums, 
uh, manage some data center large deployments, and now I'm managing control delivery. Hi, my name is Darla Ehlert. I apologize for my voice. I've been struggling with it. Uh, <laughs> my story is a little bit different than these ladies because I'm pretty new um, to this world. I graduated two years ago today, thanks to Facebook for reminding me of that this morning as I was scrolling through my news feed. Um, I graduated with my master's in computer science and I was hired into AT&T as part of the college hire program. Um, I started working for AIC shortly after I was hired into AI or at and um, I'm currently working as an upstream developer strictly solely in the community. I don't really actually code anything in AIC. All of the work that I do is um, in the OpenStack community, which is really cool to be a part of. Um, and my main focus right now is OpenStack Helm, which is going to be a huge part of uh, deploying our containerized control plane. Thank you. So now that you know our panelists, let's take a look back at at and AIC's journey and the recent history with OpenStack and how we plan to continuously improve in 2017. In 2015, we successfully executed and deployed uh, significantly scaled out AIC in a very short amount of time. We deployed 54 zones um, in three months and fully tested each zone. Through the effort, we won, at t won the Super User Award uh, back last year in Austin. Very proud moment for all of us that worked on the stage and for at t The women here on the stage were instrumental to that and um, enabling that. So in 2016, we continued our zone deployments getting to 80 plus zones, which enabled us to virtualize 34% of our network. at t focused on contributing back to the community. With that, we improved our ranking to top 20. Now, taking us into 2017, we are contributing to focus on network virtualization to support the network traffic growth that is going, expecting to grow 250,000% by 2020. Our target is 75% virtualization of at and network by then. Part of supporting that, we're augmenting our footprint and to increase our capacity and build seamless upgrade processes to enable features. So Janet, can you share with the audience and how we're going to accomplish our goals to transfer them? Sure. Um, um, in our leadership team at at and we're focusing on, th touching on three areas that we're focusing on to bring our organization there. First and foremost is to make sure that our workforce has the right skills that we need for a DevOps environment. So at and launched a corporate program called Capabilities Evolution that has built curriculums that deal with um, technology transformation, um, cloud computing, big data, and other software um, areas where people can take the classes and earn badges and mature their career. Um, we also have um, an annual program focused on the soft skills where our leadership gets out there and teaches us on how we can work with our teams or within our teams and embrace change, take risks, and um, become energized to, to change and pivot. Um, of course, we're a very diverse um, employee base and who we work with, so uh, diversity is important to us. I'm proud to say at and uh, is ranked number three in Diversity Incorporated and has many programs, um, uh, employee resource groups like um, Women of at and they have mentoring circles and re outreach communities um, to encourage STEM programs throughout. We are always looking to improve our processes and a common theme for us is automate. You hear that a lot, you'll hear today, automate our deployments, automate our testing. And the other theme I want to touch about is our need to collaborate. Um, we're really encouraging collaboration. If you walk into an at and building now, you'll see walls being torn down and very open space and really encouraging us to work together. Since we are global, we are doing, leveraging all types of technology to, to communicate again with each other and tearing down those walls within our organizations. And also, it's not just to learn about the technology, but we must use it. So tools have been an important part of our automation. And as I said before, now we look to open source as our first place. We want to use things, everything from it, but we also want to give anything we build back into community, which is a huge transformation for us. 
Thanks, Janet. That's uh, great to hear. So with all this talk around automation, process tools, can you talk to us a little bit about development? Sure. So like Janet said, automation, automation, automation. That's our mantra in development. Uh, we've you know, come a long way from the beginning days of automating um, a site, the prerequisites that come, that go into building a site, including, you know, taking a 22-tab spreadsheet and turning it into an application that feeds input into a uh, deployment tool. We've, uh, let's see, I can't really see the slide from here. Um, <laughs> in addition to deploying sites, a lot of uh, effort has to go into managing those sites. We've uh, transformed our day two operations. Once a site is deployed, we must try to keep it consistent. And not try, but we must have it to be consistent to ease our operations and also ease future upgrades and future deliveries. So we've uh, provided tooling to um, do day two operations, including what we call OpenStack Resource Manager, ORM. It deploys and creates flavors and tenant images in many sites across the world. And that allows those flavors and images to remain consistent. We have automation that audits sites and exposes variables across the site so that you can see the different package versions uh, that you know, shouldn't be there. Uh, in addition to automating the deployments of our sites and reducing the time it takes to deliver a site, we, um, you know, a lot of effort has, in development has gone into enabling the network transformation which Jen described. We uh, have Contrail at the center of our platform and we've uh, put a lot of effort into automating from beginning to end of Contrail. So taking packages frequently and into development and delivering them rapidly. Uh, also upgrading existing production zones with workloads on them and upgrading Contrail in existing sites. So there's a lot of work with the automation and the processes and the tooling and I'll let Darla talk a little bit about the people. Sure. Um, so whenever I first started back uh, two years ago roughly, um, we had pretty much zero contributions to the community. Uh, there were some, but they were far in, in between. Actually, one of the contributors is sitting in the back of the room. So thank you for actually being a contributor before we started our team. Um, myself and a few others were tasked with starting to grow a team that was solely focused on contributing back to the community. Uh, along with that, we wanted to really be able to shift the mindset of people in our company and our leadership to realize that not only is using and adopting open source a good thing, but contributing back to it is even better. You know, the, the OpenStack community has given us so much, it allows us to run our cloud. Why don't we give back to that community? So um, we started building up a team. Uh, in Barcelona, I gave a presentation, or I was part of a presentation that talked about that journey. Um, about where we were when we started, which was essentially nothing to where we had grown up to the time. And we continue to grow our contributions, keep getting larger and larger, which is exactly what we want. Um, along with that, we've kind of shifted our mindset just a little bit more to be um, a community first development. We want to go out to the community with our ideas about new features or new projects and collaborate with them on, on those new features or projects first. And that way we can make sure that we're helping build something that's gonna be beneficial to the entire community. Um, and once, you know, once we have it out in the community, um, we can backport it back into AIC uh, as, as needed. So I think that that's um, a really big part of what we're doing now. I think a really good example of something is OpenStack Helm. Um, we have recently started an official OpenStack project called OpenStack Helm, which um, uses Helm charts to deploy OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. Um, it's going to be a huge part of our October goal of having a containerized control plane. And that's going to allow us to have, you know, the, the seamless upgrades that I think Jen mentioned uh, a little bit ago. So that was kind of where we've come from, or where we've gotten to, I should say. Thanks, Darla. I think that's a lot of great information. Now we're moving along, right? We need to test that. So Janet, why don't you talk through where we were in our journey for, for testing? Um, I love to talk about the, um, our shift to the left because it's a real success story for us. Um, when we started testing, um, 
AIC, we focused on creating our test plans and our test cases for all the new features, and we executed them manually. At the end of the test cycle, then we would look at it and say, okay, which of these tests we want to automate and put into a regression suite, and that we would use to validate our deployments, and we would do post-validation um, of future releases to make sure we're backward compatible. So we, we, we were proud of our automation there. We saw how good it was going. And about a little over a year ago, we questioned and said, wait a second, why are we waiting until after our testing before we automate? Why don't we start automating before? So we worked with Accenture, who is our partner, and said, hey, we want to start automating faster and sooner. So we looked at our staffing profile. We said we need to have DevOps skill. We need our testers to know how to develop and how to write scripts and, and do that from the beginning. Um, and we implemented an agile scrum team just focused on delivering the automated test scripts. So now we have 80% of our functional tests automated at the start of our system test cycle. We're able to execute about over five times the number of test cases in a set cycle because of that. And um, we're finding defects much early in the process. So of course, we're not satisfied with shifting to the left. We are continuing in the future to do more. We're working closely with development to make sure that we are partnering and moving tests even early in the development and they're sharing um, their testing from unit test with us. So we want to continue on that journey. Um, also, we're really proud of our um, test framework that we have and we're looking within at t as we partner with um, our e team and ONAP team within the company um, of extending that so we have one single framework that works across. And uh, now Anjali is going to talk about that framework. Yeah, sure Janet. So as you have mentioned that we have shift left automation, so that is simultaneous development and automation, which will help us to achieve 80% of automation prior to IST code drop. So shift automation help us to execute 3,500 test cases in first three days of execution, and which will directly help us to achieve 80% of execution in first 24 hours. So we have different type of test cases, as I have mentioned before, that we have API, CLI, and GUI, which we have different type of frameworks. So for API, whether it's OpenStack API or non-OpenStack API, we use framework called as Tempest. So for Tempest, whether it's a, so what is Tempest? Tempest is a set of integration tests which we run against OpenStack live cluster. Tempest, we mostly do the black box testing. Uh, to run Tempest, we have configured a lot of parameters like tenant, flavor, et cetera, uh, network, et cetera. So as of now, we have configured around 200 options in our config file. To run, uh, if we have to run a small set of test cases, what we call as sanity or smoke, we use the tox e smoke. If we have to run some bigger set of test cases, what we call as regression test cases, we use the tox e full. But if we have to move to non-OpenStack API, such as provided with Contrail or VMware, we use the Tempest plugins. So what are Tempest plugins? So Tempest plugin help us to integrate external test suite to a part of Tempest run. We can either run a separate plugin or we can integrate all the plugin at the same time and we can run whole. Now, second type of test case is what we call as CLI test cases. So for running non-OpenStack uh, functionality with the CLI, we use the framework called as Test Infra Framework. So temp, uh, Test Infra Framework is a PyTest implementation of uh, Tempest. It's the same PyTest implementation, uh, implementation of Server Spec Framework. Server Spec Framework is based on Ruby language, but as open our OpenStack guys love Python the most, so what we have decided, we have decided to move the same server spec framework to a, uh, uh, to a Python language, and that we call as test infra framework. Uh, in test infra framework, uh, we execute our test cases, and we have achieved our complex configuration like SRIO, SRIOV, and DPDK, etc. Now our third and last kind of test cases that is called as Selenium. Uh, we run our GUI or UI test cases with Selenium headless framework. And the object which we have, the model which we have used is called as page object mo model. 
So whether we have to run horizon test cases or we have to run the non-open stack UI test cases, we use the framework called a Selenium headless framework. So now, yeah. Oh, no. Wow, that's a lot to take in, right? I think from, <laughs> uh, you can see it's very complex, um, what we're working on and how we're moving the needle forward. So, you know, I, I'm gonna start this off asking some questions to, to the panelists. Um, you know, I'm gonna move this back a little bit in, in the direction of, of talking about women in technology. Janet, can you, can you talk to us about your own personal experiences and challenges that you have personally faced being a woman in IT? Um, and the biggest challenge, it's, it's not just for women, but I think um, we maybe take sometimes to hard faster, is balancing that work between family and um, work. Um, for me, when I had my children, as I said, I've worked for IT the whole time, um, I wanted to be a part of ha at home mom, but I also did not want to stop my, my work. I felt if I took some years off with the way technology changed, I would become irrelevant. So um, back in those days, there was really no telecommuting. You went to the work every day and long days. Um, so I chose to take a path of working part-time, which I did um, for about eight years until my young children were full-time in school. So that was great, but it was also tough because I still wanted the, to work on the, the best projects, the top projects. I wanted to be the leader and not take a second you know, seat behind someone else. So I ended up working real smart, I guess, very focused. Most people didn't even know I was part-time and, you know, because I, I was trying to do everything in that period of time. Um, I don't regret it. I think it was the right choice for me at that point in time. And going back now, technology's changed so much and it's given us a lot more flexibility, which is great when my kids did get sick. I could I didn't have to take a vacation day anymore. I could work at home and things like that. But even you know, at this point in my life, it's those boundaries between life and work and the hours are always there. And it takes hard discipline to, to separate those two. And I think that's a lesson for all of us. It can become very encompassing. And that's the hardest thing is to balance it. I, I, I can definitely relate, right? Work-life balance is, is quite hard, especially when you have young children at home or you have older kids that you're trying to transport and you're on calls and, and working <laughs> all types of hours being in IT. Um, Kayla, how would you, what would you add to that, being a woman in IT and, and going through um, you know, the career um, and some challenges that you have faced? Yeah, uh, just to add on to what both of you said, it, uh, really helps when you have um, coworkers and bosses and peers who support your work-life balance as well. You know, if we've all called each other on the weekends or at nights, and uh, you know, when you work together to achieve a common goal, you, I don't care if your kids in the background screaming. <laughs> we get through it and uh, move on, and then we solve a problem and uh, go back to work the next day and continue. Yeah, yeah. So, Darla. You recently graduated two years ago. I'm curious, what was it like in the classroom versus the workforce um, and the community? Yes, yeah, so whenever I was in school, um, undergrad and graduate, actually, I was, it was normal for me to be the only girl in my class. Uh, I did pursue a computer science degree, and it's not very common for women to go into a degree like that. Um, you know, there might be two girls in the class with me, and that was like, a really good time because it was the only time I got to actually talk to other females. You had a lot of boyfriends then, huh? <laughs> no comment. Um, so anyway, um, as I moved on into at and you know, I've, I've only been out uh, in the, the corporate world for a couple of years, but there are so many more women than I expected. Um, they may not be developers. They might, may not have gone into, you know, a STEM degree but they have the technical knowledge that they need and just working with a lot of women in the technology area and seeing, you know, seeing them flourish is a, it's a really cool thing. Um, being here today, we had our Women of OpenStack lunch. This, it was in this room. The room was almost full. And I thought that was awesome because um, I've been to three summits now 
and I feel like each time the number of women that attend that lunch is growing. Um, and I think it's a really good thing to see is, you know, promoting more women in this type of workforce. Thanks. So, Angeline, my next question is for you. Technical difficulties. So, where did the skills that are required for you to be successful in the environment, like as large as ours? Yeah. So, I can list down a number of reasons of what are required for a QA to be successful in an environment like us. So, first and uh, foremost, which I want to say, uh, we should have holistic view of our platform. For a developer to be successful, they just need to know one functionality for which they have to code. But for a tester to be successful, they have to know all, all about the platform, how they are connected between the platform, how the data is flowing, how APIs are flowing. So they should have know each and everything about their platform. To work on an OpenStack project like us, it's a very big project, so we should have a strong networking environment. We should have strong networking knowledge. To code the functionality, we should, know, we should be good in programming skill, we should be good in automation skill, we should be go good in development skills. And also, the person should be able to trash the code which is developed by others and able to fix that code as well. Uh, the other thing uh, that testers should have good analytic knowledge because they have to write the test cases or the use cases prior to the zone handed over to us. So they should able to think what is the functionality expected and as we have now moved to the shift left, now we have started the automation prior to the zone handed over to us. So we should have good analytic knowledge. Thanks. A lot of great skills I think we need, right? <laughs> to be successful. So, Kayla, you know, around automation, um, it's essential, right? So, why don't you talk to us, and especially in this scale, why don't you give us um, some tidbits around some challenges that you face and some tidbits that you give back to the audience? Sure, it's hard to think of just one challenge that we've had to work through. Uh, <laughs> I think the, uh, the biggest thing that has made us so successful is the uh, complete automation in day two operations. So, you know, automating pieces of a platform is a little simpler than automating from end to end. In the last, uh, you know, half of year or year, we've gone from, uh, you know, automation, several tooling to a complete full continuous deployment cycle, leveraging a Jenkins pipeline that deploys a, a cloud site with zero touch. Wow, that's pretty impressive, <laughs> I would say. So, um, at this point, we're going to open it up for, for any questions that the audience may have for us. Please use the microphones if you do. No questions, guys? <laughs> well, thanks. I have a question for Kayla. Sure. Um, given your comment about how few women were in your classrooms, what do you suggest universities should do to better attract women to That's computer Kayla. science? That's we get p people confuse us all the time. All the time. <laughs> That's okay. I'm Darla. <laughs> um, having women pursue STEM degrees is a huge. Uh, I don't. I don't know how to. For me personally, I try to always gear towards the younger girls. Um, I'm very active in getting younger girls involved in STEM. I participate as much as I can in the STEM-related. Um, activities that AT&T provides. Being part of the college hire program gives me the opportunity to go out and volunteer for events like that. I think that it's really important for younger girls to understand that they are capable of getting a STEM degree. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be a stay-at-home mom. If you want to go out there and get a math degree or a chemistry degree or anything of that, like anything of that sort, you can do it. And I personally really enjoy talking to young girls about it because I struggle with myself. I definitely have imposter syndrome. Uh, I don't know anybody in the room that probably doesn't, but um, whenever I was going, or whenever I was in high school, I was trying to decide, you know, what degree should I go towards? Um, it wasn't, if it wasn't for a high school, a female high school teacher that I had telling me, hey, you need to go for this because I know you'd be awesome at it. 
I would have never gone there. I would have never even thought that that was a degree that I could pursue. And I think that it's really important for us to start getting in the minds of younger women and letting them know like you're capable of doing anything that you would really want to. And one comment I have, because we have this conversation, is you know, I graduated you know, more than 30 years ago in computer science degree and had a similar experience. So I was kind of shocked that 30 years later, the not more penetrated. So it's pretty sad. I don't know what we can do to encourage it. And for me, it, since I met Darla, it's been inspiring seeing her do those things, and I've tried to take opportunities to do the same. Yep. And at t offers a number of programs, right, to give back and get involved. So we try to do that as much as possible. Any other questions? Hello. Is this on? <laughs> yes. So I have a question for the whole panel. Um, considering that technology is a traditionally male-dominated field, uh, what experiences have you guys had that has helped um, shape who you are today that has enabled you to succeed in that field? I can start. <laughs> so I grew up the oldest of four kids and have 49 first cousins, and there were a lot of boys around my age, and I grew up playing sports uh, outside and also on a mostly boy YMCA soccer team and went to college and played soccer. Uh, but I think that made me very competitive and also uh, confident in what I'm good at. And, uh, you know, um, I've always been told, you know the most at what you are doing and that, and continue doing that and improve on your areas of weakness. I can take it. So I grew up, my father was a, uh, I grew up basically in a data center. Let's, let's put it that way. Back when, <laughs> in a Wang, uh, when Wang computers were around. So I used to take the tapes out and put them back in. And that was my job, right? <laughs> and I swore back then I wasn't going, in, going to be in technology. But interesting enough, I, I followed in that uh, footstep. And uh, you know, here today, I, I I love what we're doing. I feel like I'm challenged. I think that if you are analytical and you want to contribute, I think this is the field for women. I think this is something that you should take part in. And I encourage young girls to, to do that, right? So when um, I recently had the opportunity to speak to um, some, some boys and girls, well, back eighth grade class um, of my sons, and um, it was interesting to hear a lot of the girls did not want did not want to go into technology. They're all about fashion, <laughs> marketing, right? All the, all the nice little trends of um, you know looks great right, on paper. But um, once I got to you know talk to them a little bit about the technology and and talking to them about Facebook, they kind of you know the, where the, the social media sites where they can relate and how the data is stored. They were, really got, they were really interested, and they started to ask some questions like, oh, so you know, where do I have to go to school to do that? You know? So it was interesting. So you know, bringing that back, I think it's important, especially as us as women, is bringing it back to, to the younger youth to say, this is a field you want to be in. Um, so I'll just say my comment is slightly different. I like, was from an all-female family, and didn't, you know, first, generation to go to college so I didn't have anything I just loved solving problems and math was great because <laughs> you could reverse engineer everything and know you were right so I just went there but I started working and I was not used to being in a very male uh, classes were the same way and I think AT&T helped me a lot because they were very open to women even you know those years ago and gave us opportunities and learnings and you know they helped me really grow and flourish and a lot of times it was uncomfortable for me I had to go out of my comfort zone to to do things differently but I really attribute AT&T to making me where I am in my career yeah so as I mean, uh, I'm from India uh, 10 or 15 years back, uh, I'm from a small town, so 10 or 15 years back, girls' education was not preferred that much in India. So uh, to continue my bachelor's outside of my hometown, I fought with my family that I want to continue. And then after getting campus selected, I have to join Accenture. That time also I fought with my family that I have to continue and I have to work in IT. 
then from India coming to US, that time also I fought with my family that I want to continue and grow my career in IT. So I would say I have faced a lot of struggle, where, but I continue what I want to continue, and here I am. Fight like a girl. Yeah, yeah fight like a girl. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. I think uh, I think along with all those things, uh, being in a male-dominated field, having male advocates is amazing. Um, there, of course, there are uh, some people that aren't necessarily advocates, um, but the ones that are, I think, make a bigger difference. And you know, most of my college professors were male, um, but I had so many of them give me such good advice and push me harder than I would have ever thought. And you know, having even just anybody, regardless of gender, there pushing you, I think that's an extremely important thing. Absolutely, challenges. And <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, since some of you worked in prior domains uh, within IT uh, before moving into the cloud space and open source and open stack, how would you compare uh, diversity um, uh, in terms of? Approached your career the last couple of years and compare that to you know, the work that you did prior? Um, yeah, I, most of my years prior was traditional software development and applications, and I do think on the application side, you do have you had more women than I saw when I started moved to hosting and working more hardware and infrastructure. So networking, when working with network engineers, that's where it's a difference in lack. So I do I did see more experience and more development um, and more in the software side. Now everything is going software, so I think maybe that will increase. But um, I think that's a big difference. When I started in the latter part, I started seeing the old trends come back because I was moving more into um, an infrastructure networking world. Yep. And for me, I, I started off writing requirements, engineering, and um, e-commerce, right? So there was a lot of women. And believe it or not, there was pretty, I, I would say we had, had a team of 10. It was about five, so it was about 50%. Um, you know, then as I shifted from into lab management, right, definitely the <laughs> It was male dominant, right, for sure. Um, it was probably, I think I was the only female at one point. <laughs> so it's encouraging starting to see now from a platform, um, from a quality assurance team, I have a very large team that has uh, a significant amount of women. And I try to make sure that we do have diversity in the team, because it's important, right, to show that and to have different perspectives. Any other? Questions? One of the best bosses I ever had, her name was Lynn Bickley. She used to work for AT&T and uh, maybe taught me the most of my career. So I, I, I'm not sure she wasn't the best, but, but there are other bosses that might hear this, so I have to be careful. Uh, <laughs> so have, are there any special challenges? You mentioned diversity in your group, so that's got to include men. Have you had special challenges with men on your teams, uh, or how, how do you approach it? Is there any thing different? I can take it. <laughs> um, most of my team, I've, like I said, I've only been in the in the workforce for a couple of years, but. I've pretty much only worked with men. Um, and this started, like I said prior, whenever I was in my classes. Um, prior to college, I was used to working with my girlfriends. Uh, you know, if they say, your teacher says group project, you all like look at each other like, yeah, you and me, you got this, we got this. <laughs> um, and then I, would, I went to college and I was with all men and they don't wanna pair with the girl in the room. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know if they're just like nervous around girls, which is true. Um, or if, you know, maybe they, I don't know, if they think I'm less competent or maybe they think I'm a genius and they're scared to work with me. I don't know. But, you know, th that is something that I struggled with um, even now. Um, we, we have a lot of male advocates, I feel like, on our team, which is awesome. Um, but I have worked with other males that are 
not as willing to work with me. And I, it could just be random, but I don't know, my gut tells me it's because I'm a female. So, you know, it, it goes both ways. There have definitely been challenges, but um, I think for the most part, we, I, you, we just get through it. You know, from my side, right, I think it's having the common goal, right? You, you have something you're gonna work on, you focus on that, and you need the diversity of different perspectives, right? Everyone, you may have a person who's very analytical, right, who is a male, female, male, doesn't make a difference, right? They have a different view set than what you may have. So it's hearing, listening and hearing what they're saying is really important, but making sure that you're building the team to, have equal rights, right? Equal perspectives. And, and if you have that, then you'll have a team that's successful, that can collaborate, work together, um, you know, synchronize together and, and be, be in play, right? Then that's teamwork, right? And collaboration, so. Before I joined AIC, I was a, a software developer and then a very small team. And I came into AIC and I thought, wow, this is the most diverse team and organization I have ever seen and it was uh, exciting to work with people from all different kinds of backgrounds because you learned uh, where they came from and I learned so much outside of the, just the technology. That's true. Okay, any questions? All right, we got to wrap up. Yep. So I'm just going to wrap up with um, one slide. So. We here at at and are, are partnering with other large enterprise companies to focus on contributing operators' um, needs. So if you're interested in uh, working you know, along, uh, alongside us and um, contributing back, um, we're, we're partnering with several different um, companies, large companies. Um, we have multiple sessions that are, being, that are going on. Um, so we would love for you to join us. One's on roadmap working session. Um, also, uh, another is on contributing back as far as uh, the large OpenStack uh, contributors, operators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.